So, um, I'm presenting uh, on behalf of the team, the international team, uh, and it, this was truly a collaborative effort between uh, institutions in the U.S. Uh, and the Health Sciences University here. Couldn't have done it without any one of the members of this team. Uh, so I'm privileged to present it for them. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty uh, detailed technical um, assessment. Unique anywhere in the world, as I'll explain. And so, presenting this is a you know as a challenge. I know not all of you are all that interested in the technical details, but some of you are. So I'm going to go wend my way down the middle between the highly technical and not. Now, why are we here? Well, this is why we're here, of course. It doesn't look quite this bad out there today, but there are many days when it does look like that. And as you heard, um, we. Um, Developed this project that has not a great name, but this is the project, the name we're stuck with Impact of Urban Air Pollution on Public Health for the Ministry of Environment. Um, now, the background of the project from the substantive side is that uh, Umatour has some of the worst outdoor air pollution in the world, that you, you well know. Problem of growing concern among the public, media, and policymakers. Considerable extent. This pollution is due to coal heating in the residential sector or other sources such as power plants, vehicles, and industry play roles. Um, although there are other important impacts of air pollution, including on visibility, property values, general cleanliness, climate, vegetation, agriculture, you can name a lot of other impacts. Perhaps the most important is that on health. Most studies that have been done elsewhere in the world find that the health impacts in terms of the economic value of them exceed the other impacts from, health, uh, from the air pollution. So the rationale of the projects is that most uh, observers agree on the need to eventually reduce emissions. Obviously, you don't want 500 years from now to have these terrible pollution levels. But there is not yet clarity on the benefits of doing, doing so quickly rather than more slowly. And, of course, the choice uh, between a rapid and more leisurely improvement has substantial differences in cost and uh, policy uh, approaches. So provide better evidence of the benefits of different strategies to reduce uh, UV's air pollution. We have undertaken an assessment focused on the following aim. Which what health benefits could be expected from cleaner household stoves and fuels and associated emissions reductions in other sectors by 2025 under various scenarios? You know, moderate, rapid um, improvement. So the summary of the approach we took. We first estimate what health effects can be expected until, under, uh, until 2024 under business as usual. Uh, scenario, no major changes in what's being done. There are improvements being planned, so this is not no changes, there's no additional changes. Um, for example, we assume that the so-called MCA type improved cold stove that has already been penetrated to um, some 180,000 households will actually be completely, um, or has been completely penetrated by the beginning of this year. So that benefit is already built into the business as usual. Scenario. Then we examine two alternative emission scenarios in which more ambitious controls are undertaken across all sectors and all major sectors, households, vehicles, power plants, heat only boilers, trash burning in industry. Um, uh, the scenarios we look at are moderately accelerated improvements, health benefits improvements in all sectors at a rate, at a rate faster than BAU, including full deployment of cleaner stoves. <coughs> and um, uh, uh, maximum rate of improvement, scenario two, feasible but ambitious rates of change in emissions. Now the star here indicates that uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Pujar uh, from uh, Health Sciences University, after my talk and after the coffee break, we'll talk in more detail about some of these issues. So we'll hear, you'll hear more detail about exactly what's included in these scenarios, because I know that will be of interest to people. So innovations in this assessment. <coughs> We've um, 
done the assessment based on exposure assessment, that is total exposure assessment. Because pollution affects health no matter where you breathe it. So you might be part of the day indoors, part of the day outdoors. Your total exposure at the end of the day is what uh, results in the health impact. So you can't look just indoors, you can't look just outdoors, you have to look at the combination of the two. So called total exposure assessment. Now this is a well known procedure in the scientific literature for exposure, but it's actually, as far as I know, never been applied in a policy document like this. So um, we assess total exposure of the UV population over the 10 years of the assessment going forward under the different scenarios, both indoor and outdoor. And it's distinguished separately for young children, since uh, there are uh, health effects for young children from air pollution that are different from the health effects for adults. Um, we require estimating the effect of indoor and outdoor sources on pollution levels throughout the year. So much, and that includes estimating how much of the outdoor air pollution penetrates indoors. It also means calculating outdoor air pollution at every single place in the city. And it can't be every single you know, house, but nevertheless, we use there are some 6,000 separate estimates by a grid, one kilometer by one kilometer grid in the city. So uh, we can get a true population estimate as a result. We also do this by household type because there are different penetration rates and different other characteristics of the three major household types of GER apartments in separate houses. It also meant looking at the trends in these households over the next 10 years, and the amount of time spent by different population groups in each, indoors and outdoors, in each of these uh, household types. So you can already see that this is uh, requiring a lot of data input. Um, this was necessary because of the special character of uh, UV's pollution, particularly in the winter. When outdoor pollution is so high from household sources, but it penetrates <coughs> indoors, outdoors, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to look only outdoors or only indoors, but basically everybody in this city is living in one big room. It's a room that's 6,000 square kilometers in, in the floor area, but in the winter, you've got inversions that trap the pollution underneath it. So, although it's a big room, it's not a big enough room to have 200,000 or more than 200,000 coal stoves plus other sources of pollution without building up terrible levels of pollution. One result of this is that we found that over time, environmental tobacco smoke, secondhand smoke, the smoke from other people's cigarettes, start to be an important part of the picture. Now, 60% now of households in Ulaanbaatar have a smoker. So that's a lot of environmental tobacco smoke. Now, the city has, or the country has, um, implemented controls on public, smoking in public places, but that doesn't apply to households. To change behavior in households is a different kind of uh, intervention. It requires changing the social context of smoking, the awareness, and so forth. We don't consider any changes in environmental tobacco smoke over this 10 years in households, but that may be uh, pessimistic. Maybe we can reduce the amount of smoking in households. We do believe it's the first analysis in the world for a city based on total exposure assessment. The second innovation in this project is the use of so-called integrated exposure response relationships, IER as we call them. And these come out of the newly published Global Burden of Disease Studies. Um, they develop um, uh, exposure response relationships for five major disease types associated with air pollution. So what do, they, what do they mean by integrated? I'm not going to show the details of this. I showed it in my lecture yesterday here on campus, uh, actually. But basically, it combines the health evidence from active smoking, people who stick burning stuff in their mouth, which is the worst possible thing you can do, stick burning stuff in your mouth. But it's not so great to have somebody else sticking it in their mouth near you, because you get secondhand smoke. It's not so great having a combustion inside a house that pollutes the indoor house. And it's not so great having uncontrolled combustion even in a city, particularly a city like Ulaanbaatar that doesn't have good ventilation during much of the year. So it combines the health evidence across all four categories, active smoking, indoor air pollution from combustion, <coughs> secondhand smoking, and outdoor air pollution into common exposure response curves. So it greatly strengthens the database, our confidence of 
about the health effects, and I'll show a bit more detail. These were used in the global burden of disease to estimate the total impact of air pollution. But R is, um, um, and they incorporate the results of dozens of separate quantitative studies of health effects from many countries, outdoor air pollution, smoking, secondhand smoke, household air pollution, and so forth. But we incorporated these IARs into an assessment tool that allows projections of health benefits, or changes in health due to changes in exposure. So, as far as we know, the first to do this, I'm sure not the last, because these IARs have just been published. In fact, they're in press now, they haven't actually come out yet. And um, I'm sure many other people will do this as well. So it's the first one, I think, to, to use this. Now, we use this international information, these uh, integrated exposure response curves, but of course we have grounded in information, local information in here, because you know, we want to fit the local scene. So we had to gather local information to estimate demographic and health trends. We had to know how many, how many people are going to be in the next scene, how many children are going to be, you know, the different population groups, who's going to be living in what households. Also, the background health conditions. How much stroke is there going to be over the next 10 years? How much lung cancer? And then from that, we can determine how much of it comes from air pollution. Again, the star indicates that um, Dr. Fougier will talk in more detail about how we did uh, this assessment, these assessments. We also incorporated recent measurements done by uh, our team, uh, Rufus Edwards, um, on stove emission factors. These were done as part of the assessment of the MCA cold stove project and allowed us to uh, get a good idea of what it means when you get the so-called improved cold stoves. How much does that change outdoor air and how much does it change indoor air in different kinds of housing? Um, uh, my uh, doctoral student, um, Drew Hill, was here last winter uh, doing measurements in GERS um, um, to understand the exposures and also to get a picture of the penetration rates, how much of the outdoor air pollution comes at source. So these um, studies weren't actually part of this project, but we couldn't have done the project if they hadn't been done and we had the information available. And then uh, Jay Turner at Washington University did new uh, detailed air pollution modeling, outdoor air pollution modeling. Um, uh, we looked at changes uh, with the different scenarios, with the different emission patterns, not only the total amount of emissions, but where those emissions occur and what time of year. And of course, local information on um, meteorology, grounded by available outdoor measurements. So, what type of air pollution? I mean, there are a lot of different types of air pollution. Um, yeah, um, and um, dozens at least uh, that have uh, been a concern for both indoor and probably more like hundreds, indoors and outdoors. The most well studied by far are small particles, some fine particulate matter or PM2.5, very small particles that can penetrate into the deep lung, they even penetrate into the blood vessels and then through the <coughs> tissues like the heart. Uh, it's the best single measure of health risk from combustion sources. It's used, for example, to compare the risk of cigarette smoke. Pack of cigarettes in the U.S. and have its tar content. What does tar stand for? It's called total aerosol residual. It's the amount of, you measure on a filter, just what the cigarette people do. It's the same thing we do in air pollution. We measure particles on a filter. Small particles. It's the best indicator of risk. Now, there are thousands of other things in cigarette smoke. Similar in outdoor air pollution. You can't measure everything all the time, and it's very hard to add them together even if you do. So everybody, the best, agreed that the best single measure is PM2.5. Um, and, in general, actions to reduce combustion PM2.5 will also act to reduce many of the other pollutants, not all of them. So, you know, there's a policy reason to do this. Um, so like the burden of the global burden of disease, we focus on PM2.5. Some specific types of, of, of health effects, however, may be better indicated by other pollutants, such as carbon monoxide, which might be a better indicator, for example, of uh, low birth weight, um, uh, nitrogen sulfur oxides, ozone, and carcinogenic compounds, such as the PAHs, might be a better indicator of cancer. 
but this was not part of what we did in the study. And then I want to emphasize that even though we concentrate on being 255 and the decrease of it, all of the major air pollutants should still be considered in regulating air pollution in UV as in every other um, country in the world. It doesn't mean you get off the hook about those others, but if you're trying to do a health assessment, the only one we can really do it with today is PM2.5. And the largest health effects, even counting these, the largest health effects in terms of lost life years, premature mortality, are closely associated with PM2.5. So what do we mean by health effect? It's not straightforward, actually, to compare health effects across disease types. Now, how do you compare a uh, lung cancer with a pneumonia or a, um, a stroke with a heart disease? And different population groups. The death of a child is quite different than the death of an 85-year-old from a stroke. So the international health community has thought long and hard about this and has developed metrics to do uh, these kinds of comparisons. Mortality is often used, but this has limitations because it treats child deaths the same as deaths of older adults, and it doesn't patch. If you have COPD for many years, and your, your life is impaired, you're, you're, you're in a condition of ill health, but you may not have died. You have to count the years of illness, as well as the death, but not just the death, the prematurity of the death. So the death of a nine-year-old is not the same as the death of a nine-year-old. So, the term that's used is disability adjusted life years, DALAs, which incorporates the lost life years due to the prematurity of the death, as well as the years lost to illness. It's less familiar to the general public, but it's very common in international health assessment. It is the main metric in the global burden of disease. And this afternoon, if you're interested, I can describe more how the DALA is created. So, we report premature deaths and lost DALAs in all our results by disease and in total. And this is the international norm for these kinds of assessments. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to now briefly describe the results. <coughs> and we can come back to them and discuss, look at some more details. First, the results for outdoor air pollution. Then, um, population exposures. And then, health impacts total and per capita. Now, first of all, just to calibrate ourselves, um, those of you who aren't always thinking about PM 2.5, I mean, how much PM 2.5 was unhealthy? Well, one um, way to look at that, in a good way, is to what the international agencies and the national regulatory agencies have decided is should be the standard. They've done large reviews of the literature, and they redo them often, well, not often, but every five or ten years, reassess the literature, decide what is appropriate for health. WHO, um, uh, has done this and has its air quality guideline for PM 2.5 is 10 micrograms per cubic meter for annual average. And then they say that no public microenvironment, indoor or outdoor, should be more than 35. But it should shoot for 10 as the yeah, annual average. Now that's very strict. But it is, I was on that committee, it is uh, bolstered by, I mean, the evidence base is there. In fact, I think. And when we reconvene that air quality deadline, which will probably happen in the next couple of years, it's likely to go down to seven or something like that, because there is evidence of some health effects below 10. And I don't want to discourage you, but, uh, that, but in any case, 10 is the current number. Standards, well, the USA, no country in the world, as far as I know, has actually used this 10. The WHO recommended them. The US recently lowered it to 12 from 15. European Union is at 20, and China is at 35. This 35 is derived from this, I think. <clears throat> so that gives you sort of an idea of what different or, um, parts of the world, during and looking at the reviews, you know, think what we ought, you ought to be exposed to. <clears throat> so and I'll talk um, the, about the outdoor air pollution results. And I'm not going to show the detailed results. This is just one example. These are the winter time, you know, there are other times of year. These are the concentrations of micrograms per cubic meter in 2014, that's today, you know, this year, I guess this winter, so uh, that's us now. And these are the estimated levels, you know, higher pollution in the center of the city and lower in the, in the outer levels. Um, business as usual, uh, after uh, 10 years, you know, the conditions are worse. 
And with under the moderate improvement, they're substantially better. But still quite a bit of pollution, well above the standards. Well, this is just one example of many maps like this. Just to remind you, this was estimated for each, in, in this map, 2,300 20, one kilometer by one kilometer grid cells. Um, you know, we've done this for the business as usual and also for the two scenarios. The model was calibrated against actual measurements in 2013. No model, I can rarely the models actually represent exactly what is actually measured in the field, so we adjusted the model to fit the measurements, which is a common way of calibrating models. Uh, Citywide population weighted concentrations were estimated. So each of these uh, one kilometer by one kilometer cells has a different number of people in it. So the reports, the numbers I'm going to show you are not the average geographically, but the average in terms of where people, what people are breathing when they go outside their house in the, in the city. So it's population weight. This is an important uh, for a health assessment. You don't really care about in every you know, the whole city. You care about what people are actually breathing. Um, and uh, we didn't, we couldn't include everything. We don't have heating and stoves that are in small kiosks. Uh, we don't have. So some industrial uh, missions, uh, particularly kilns, we don't deal with resuspended road and wind bomb and dust because those are not combustion particles. Can't do everything. Future studies might want to include these. Um, so I'm not going to show you distributions, you know, in, in uh, uncertainty intervals because that complicates uh, a, a, a summary presentation like this. But do be assured, we did look at the uncertainties and the distributions. So when I report a single number that does, we do have an idea of what the distribution is. So this again, just an example, here's the baseline. This was the average, um, but uh, there is quite a distribution. There are some places that are quite clean, other places that are very much more dirty, and that's for every one of these modeling results we have distribution. Um, so here's the result, the um, summary for the three scenarios. Um, here's the current situation, we estimate that the average Outdoor population weighted outdoor uh, concentration over the year, worse in the winter, of course, but over the year, like, uh, I can't remember exactly what that is, 74 or something like that. If you don't do anything more than what's planned now in the city, remember this includes all improved coal stoves, the pollution steadily goes up. This is outdoor pollution. The modest amount of uh, improvements will improve things substantially, but a more aggressive will reduce them substantially more. Um, okay, now I want to talk about the um, indoor uh, um, levels, the uh, way we calculate the indoor levels. Now this is quite complex, involves a number of models, so I'm not going to go through it in detail. I'm just put a few things here just to just to convince you that we did think about it seriously and try to quantify very a every aspect of it. So here, for example, is based on uh, measurements of uh, different kinds of stoves. This is the um, measurement, uh, measurements and calculation of infiltration factors. Here are the time activity, how much time the different population groups spend indoors and outdoors in the winter and summer and so forth. So um, this is just to illustrate these, these details are all in the appendices to the report. Um, so here's the result. Um, this is the population weighted exposure estimate, so it's average to the population, the baseline, um, and um, that's roughly the situation now. Here's the percent from indoor exposures, dominated by indoor exposures, and uh, to environmental tobacco smoke is significant. Um, and that's a little bit different in the different uh, population groups. And then this is business as usual, year 2024, today, I should say. Today in the shape 2024, as I mentioned, it solely drifts upwards. So you're not improving things. Some reduction in emission rates, but because, uh, but a, a small increase in exposure because of increased population and economic activity. You just have more stoves and more cars, and you know, and then um, you know more industrial activity and so forth, power plants and so on because of economic growth. All right, what about, uh, so there's the uh, today, and there's um, what we estimate in business as usual. So it's not a huge increase, but it's certainly not getting better. What about scenario one? 
So that's um, um, business as usual, and uh, here uh, would be that, but the ordinary one, it would be that instead. So that's about a 40% reduction, despite the population and economic growth. But levels are still well above international norms. And the distribution, you know, you can see that the environmental tobacco smoke portion starts rising. All right, again, I'm just going to say it again. So that's if you do business as usual in 2024, 20, you get about 75. But if you do this um, uh, group of pollution controls,